Hello, I'm Sean Holden and this is the first lecture for the part two course on machine learning and Bayesian inference. Welcome. I'm just going to start um, by giving you the big picture. Uh, the course has two parts in its title um, and there are good reasons for that. Um, mostly the course is indeed about machine learning. Um, it is deliberately a foundational kind of course on machine learning. Uh, you won't hear me utter the word deep very often and there's a perfectly good reason for that which is that if you don't understand in some level of detail how a linear regression model works then you certainly don't understand how a convolutional network or an LSTM or anything more complicated works. And it is clearly the case right now that you can achieve great things with a few lines of prologue and a few calls to the deep learning library of your choice. Uh, but if you don't understand uh, what the calls to that machine learning library are actually doing behind the scenes, then you don't really understand what you're doing. So. The first key uh, aim in this course really is that you should go away um, understanding things at a, at a fairly uh, low and technical level and those things then generalize very easily to um, the bigger models uh, that you may or may not uh, actually want to use. Um, the second thing with the machine learning is that uh, not all of the machine learning world um, is focused on deep learning models at the moment there are scenarios where they are not appropriate. So it's worth knowing about the state of the art in um, uh, some other uh, methods as well, um, and in particular um, in the area of support vector machines. And some of the uh, foundational unsupervised methods, um, in particularly the one that I'm going to present that uses something called the ELM algorithm. Um, and the EM algorithm has a, a vast array of applications, not only in machine learning, but also in the wider realm um, in which you are in some way processing signals of interest. I also want to talk a bit about how you do machine learning the right way in practice, because it can be um, tempting just to get some data, slap your machine learning model on it, get a number uh, that denotes some measure of performance and say that's it. Well, in practice that's not really good enough, in particular if you want to demonstrate that the number you get for your method is better than the one that comes out of someone else's method. Um, in order to make that uh, a convincing statistical test of the difference between two methods, there's a lot more you need to know. And I'm not going to go into the, the full details of uh, what I'm going to cover in the course right here, this will all um, come to light eventually. Uh, but I think the key takeaway point is that this is really a technical course on how you do machine learning right and how you understand what's going on. I will add one thing, which is that I'm also uh, going to look at Bayesian supervised learning, moving into the, the wider kind of uh, remit of the course. The key selling point for Bayesian methods is that they allow you to quantify the certainty that you attach to the predictions that your machine learning model makes. This has always been their key selling point. It can be tricky to do it in practice, but you do want to know about this before you go into the wider realms of uh, uh, deep learning models because there is huge interest at the moment in combining the two. People really want deep learning models that can quantify uncertainty, and uh, quantification of uncertainty is where Bayesian inference uh, meets machine learning and gives you a big payoff. So I'm going to talk a bit about that as well. Now the wider remit, the, uh, the Bayesian inference part of the course, essentially uh, gives you a very, very general way of thinking about reasoning under uncertainty. The machine learning models I talk about generally fit into this Bayesian inference framework. Um, some of them are more clearly what we might refer to as frequentist methods, not Bayesian, uh, and I think I'll probably have something to say about that later, um, but in practice that's not so much an issue. Um, Bayesian inference allows you essentially 
To move from the context of more classical AI, where we did a lot of representation using logic, and move in to a scenario where we do knowledge representation by setting up probability distributions, and then inference becomes the computation of conditional probabilities rather than uh, logical deduction um, using a theorem prover or something sim similar. The payoff here is that in practice you really do want to be able to quantify uncertainty and that's where I'm going to start. So, a good point to start this uh, whole discussion is the point at which we left off last year. I talked a lot of, last year about classical um, artificial intelligence methods, about search, about planning, about knowledge representation and reasoning, and I finished off with a, a little introduction to the backpropagation algorithm and uh, um, feed-forward neural networks, um, which we'll be coming back to later. In classical AI, the logicist approach um, involves modeling the world using some form of logical language and then inferring things uh, that you might um, want to be able to know or do uh, using logical deduction. And I made some reference last year to the fact that this can be harder than you think. Um, and it really comes down to the fact that uh, in practice humans, uh, when compared with logical systems are inherently both lazy and ignorant. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you try to uh, set up a knowledge base in a logical language, um, it tends not to be feasible to get a set of rules that is really exhaustive. Um, and even if we could, it would become infeasible to apply them. So I think I probably gave the example of uh, a logical rule that says if I put my car key in to my car and turn it, then the car will start. Well, this is hopelessly naive. It needs a whole bunch of side conditions, and it's a bunch of side conditions that you can never fully enumerate. The battery has to be charged, there has to be petrol in it, there's about 12 miles of wiring in there, I would imagine, and uh, none of it has to be broken, and so on. And if you did model things to that level of um, uh, fidelity, then actually doing inference uh, would become problematic. And this is a, this is a key uh, problem for the logicist approach. In terms of ignorance, it may be that there just isn't enough knowledge around for us to write uh, sensible rules, um, and even if we could, it may be that there's not enough information around to apply them. Now, the, the modern way of dealing with all of this stuff is to say, let's not use logic anymore, let's not regard things as being true or false, let's think in terms of degrees of belief um, that means that we can kind of think, well, something is true or false, but we might not know which. But we can talk about our degree of belief in one or the other of those possibilities being the case. And this is where probability is the tool that you want to use. Um, the Bayesian interpretation of probability essentially says that your numbers that you attach um, uh, to things, and you say the probability is x, are actually degrees of belief. They're not uh, things that tell you about repeated experiments. That's the domain of the frequentist. And I don't really want to get too much into the philosophical um, difference between those because uh, that's not really useful for my purposes here. Um, probability just lets you give some proposition a degree of belief between 0 and 1 and gives you a calculus for computing with such degrees of belief. It is the perfect tool for this application and it has essentially become entirely dominant um, in modern AI as a means of dealing with uncertainty. Now, I probably mentioned during uh, last year's course that um, yes, you will find copious bodies of research referring to things such as fuzzy logic um, or Dempster Schaefer um, theory. And there are various other calculuses that try um, to give you a method of handling uncertainty um, within AI, and they've had greater or less success. But on the whole, I think it's fair to say that probability theory has established itself as the most useful and successful way of doing this. And indeed, if you look at any of the top AI conferences at the minute, if you look at AAAI and you look at um, NeurIPS, 
um, any of the real top conferences, um, International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence, uh, inter um, International Conference on Machine Learning, um, you will have a very hard time finding any kind of uh, work dealing with uncertainty that isn't using probability theory. Okay, you can just assume really that this is the de facto way of doing things. Last year we also looked in quite a lot of uh, detail at um, a, a very kind of all-encompassing uh, way of thinking about how an agent acts in the world, uh, which then um, shows itself in search and planning problems. Um, in search problems, okay, you should be familiar with these now. Uh, we could perform actions to change the state of the world, we have a start state. We want a sequence of actions that's as cheap as possible that will get us through a sequence of states ending in hopefully an optimal goal. Um, we also looked at game playing, which then ups the ante a bit by allowing uh, an adversary to become involved. And we looked at um, planning um, in the form of situation calculus and in the form of various other calculuses. But all of these also suffer because they're very hard edged um, and uncertainty isn't really allowed to come into them. Okay, it's you do this action, you go from this state to this state. Well, the world, of course, isn't always like that. Um, and the more we try and uh, embody agents within the world, uh, the less like that the world becomes. I guess the, uh, the, the topical application of interest here would be self-driving cars. Um, it is very difficult to make self-driving cars uh, because the world that they are in is very uncertain and modeling that uncertainty is very hard. Now, Something that I'm not going to get into uh, in any detail in this course. And something that all these things also tend to have in common when you're thinking about putting agents in the world is that uh, there's um, an element of time involved. Uh, as actions are performed, time is moving forward. Okay, um, some models have specific ways of dealing with that. In other courses, you'll probably have seen hidden Markov models where that's a an inherent probabilistic uh, setup but has time built into it, just as some of these classical approaches do. I'm not going to have time really to talk about how um, Bayesian inference uh, gets to the point where you can um, model that kind of thing explicitly. I will at this stage just point out that there's an entire subject called utility theory. Utility is used uh, to allow you to move away from a naive conception of just having a goal state. Um, to a situation where you model um, the preferences that you have between states of the world in a systematic way. There is a calculus for utility. Um, uh, utility is a tricky thing to deal with. The classical example is the utility of money, um, which people will generally just assume is linear in the first instance. but. Uh, people who've um, studied uh, utility of money and the way it's perceived by people will find that actually it's initially linear. So initially the more money you have the better, but once you get to a point that utility starts to level off and having more doesn't really make so much difference to you, which kind of makes sense. How much would you be happy with? Would you be happy if you had 25 million in the bank? Would that be enough to have in the bank that actually getting more wouldn't make you feel like a happier person? You probably all have a different figure uh, which this takes place, but I think it's fairly clear that at some point for you, the relationship levels off. And interestingly, it levels off in the other direction as well. Initially, the more debt you have, the worse things get, but it's possible to get into so much debt that, well, to use a cliche, um, if you owe a little bit of money, it's your problem, and if you owe an extremely large amount of money, it's your bank's problem. Okay, so that distinction starts to kick in. You can combine that with something called decision theory, which combines this kind of Bayesian uh, probabilistic approach to modeling the world with utility theory. And you can then um, use a system for making a, a rational agent work within the world that tries to maximize the expected utility that it gathers over time. Okay, This gives you quite an all-encompassing um, way of thinking about uh, AI uh, when uncertainty is an issue. But I'm only going to have time in this course really to talk as far as um, using Bayesian inference to set up a kind of a static model 
um, of the world and uh, then make inferences within that context. Now the last key now the last key thing that I introduced in AI1, uh, AI or just artificial intelligence now last year, um, was the idea of learning from examples. Now again, we have inherent uncertainty in this situation um, because the whole point of supervised learning is to generalize. Meaning that if you've seen some examples, you then want to be able to make useful predictions for ones that you've never seen before. Um, now, we can start attaching probabilities to things and then develop uh, all of machine learning essentially in a probabilistic and eventually Bayesian framework. And uh, that's, so you can think within this course as machine learning has been one application of the wider Bayesian inference, but also what Bayesian inference as I'm introducing it as really a subset of a, um, a, a wider um, conception of AI uh, as talking about modeling the world under uncertainty. So I should say we're, where we're actually going to go now then, in some more detail. Uh, before I launch into that, I will first say uh, that there are three handouts for you on the course website. Uh, the first is the obvious uh, one that you will be wanting to have for supervisions. Uh, that is the Machine Learning and Bayesian Inference Problem Sheet, which you should probably download now and start looking at. Uh, but there are also two more general um, handouts here, uh, one of which we will only need later. Uh, it is called How to Evaluate Gaussian Integrals. Now, for the purpose of this course, I will give you a result about a particular kind of integral, and I'll expect you uh, in the problem sheet to, to use this thing. Um, I made this handout because Sometimes people are curious and they want to know how to evaluate such things. So, how to evaluate Gaussian integrals tells you how to evaluate this kind of thing, but it is not examinable. I'm not going to ask you to do what's in this sheet um, in an exam. Okay, It is purely there for you to enjoy if you like knowing how to do this kind of stuff. Okay, But the result itself you will need to use within the course. The other one, which is I think the most important one from the outset, is called some supplementary notes on probability. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about probability, as you can guess. Um, what these what these supplementary notes tell you is that fundamentally, um, calculating everything um, in probabilistic terms is really easy. What this handout tells you essentially is that you can compute. Uh, any probabilistic result you like, and it's very, very easy to do it if you know um, the joint probability distribution of all the things you're interested in. It also shows you uh, how to do that, and it also derives a couple of um, useful things that you need to know in manipulating probabilities. But the point of that handout is to try and convince you that actually all of this stuff is fundamentally pretty straightforward. Okay. The difficulty comes in practice um, because although the underlying process involves nothing more than uh, evaluating some fairly straightforward sums and integrals, um, in practice that evaluation can be hard. Okay. You all come across integrals that are tricky to evaluate and that can certainly be the problem here. Okay. But the idea with that sheet is that you should read it and see the fundamental process that's involved um, and that should uh, convince you that if you have a probability distribution that specifies the probability for over all of the random variables that you're interested in, that if you have a probability distribution uh, that tells you about all the random variables that you might be interested in, then there's a fairly straightforward procedure for computing any inference you like from that in the form of a conditional probability. You will need uh, to be familiar with quite a bit of stuff from earlier courses, um, particularly material covering probability and standard distributions and how you manipulate Gaussians um, and so on. Okay? You'll also need to be familiar with stuff going back to NST Maths again, 
um, and particularly uh, a lot of the linear algebra um, that you would have covered back then. I made a warning at the start of AI that if you'd forgotten how to do derivatives, um, you needed to revise that material in order to understand the later material on uh, neural networks. Well, the same uh, warning applies here. You really do need to revise uh, what you know about probability calculus, both integral and differential, um, and linear algebra um, in order to follow some of the material in this course. In places, it gets quite involved. Um, so the better prepared you are to start with, then the happier time I think you're going to have. So here's the big picture in about three slides. What we're going to do is get rid of our old idea of having a knowledge base um, as some big collection of logical rules that describe the world. And instead, we're going to have a probability distribution. We're going to take everything about the world that we think is of interest to us, turn it into a random variable, and specify some big probability distribution on all of those random variables. Okay, that then represents our, our beliefs about the world. Okay, the probabilities that we assign to all the combinations of uh, the random variables kind of encapsulates our beliefs. We then replace the task of logical inference, deriving something using a theorem prover from some kind of logically um, constructed representation, with the idea of computing a conditional probability distribution. Okay, instead of inferring um, that in a particular situation um, I might want to perform a particular action, I compute the probability distribution of actions conditional on what I know about my current situation. Okay, That is the fundamental idea of moving into the use of probability theory for uncertainty. Now, both of them uh, can have their own attached complexities. Firstly, representing something um, that complicated. Okay, If we have uh, a thousand random variables uh, that we think are interesting about the world and we want a probability distribution on all 1,000 of those variables, we get the question of how do we actually represent that in a way that we can easily deal with. Now, we have two fundamental ways within uh, the Bayesian inference approach of doing that. One is called a Bayesian network, and the other is called a Markov random field. These are merely ways of succinctly representing um, joint probability distributions. And they exploit the fact that when we decide that here are the thousand random variables we're interested in, we may also be able to apply um, some prior expert knowledge um, about how those random variables interact with one another. Okay, Real problems have structure. We may know that certain random variables have particular kinds of dependence on some other random variables. We may only be able to infer that quite loosely, but both Bayesian networks and Markov random fields allow us to introduce some prior knowledge about how things work together in order to come up with a hopefully more usable representation of a full probability distribution over probably a very large number of random variables. The inference task, okay, which has now become the computation of conditional probability, is fundamentally straightforward, as I'm about to show you. Um, but of course, uh, nothing in computer science is ever quite that easy. I've already mentioned that you may end up with summations uh, or integrals that are, are tricky to evaluate. But in the, the sort of coarse and more basic um, scenario, it may simply be that computational complexity is again um, the thing that becomes a bugbear for you. And uh, I'm about to show you why, why it is that all of this is fundamentally straightforward, but also um, uh, in practice uh, that doesn't necessarily carry through quite as nicely as you'd hope. So, here's the way you think about it. Everything of interest in the world is a random variable, and the probabilities associated with random variables are summarizing our uncertainty. Okay? Don't worry for now too much about how we're going to come up with those. Okay, there are, that's a separate issue. Just imagine we already know them. So, here is the world. <laughs> 
um, it is represented by n random variables, okay, v1, v2, all the way up to vn. So our joint distribution over those variables now becomes the equivalent of what we used to call a knowledge base. Okay, the probability at the bottom of this slide, probability of the vector v, which is the probability of v1, v2, all the way up to vn, if we can get a probability for all possible combinations of uh, the values for these random variables, then we have the equivalent of a knowledge base. What next? Well, we will generally have observed some actual values, okay? If we are not within the sort of uh, full um, uh, human level robot conception of an agent, uh, but are dealing with something a little bit more current and uh, a bit more currently reasonable and applied, we might have an agent that say controls a jet engine, okay? It will be dealing with all sorts of uh, random variables involving the positions of valves, temperatures, pressures, uh, and so on. Um, some of those will be measurements, okay? The oil pressure at a particular point uh, is a random variable, but your agent will uh, at any time presumably have um, the value that that random variable currently takes on. Um, its inference may be how does it set a parameter for some other part of the engine conditional on that observed oil pressure. Now, the question then is, how do we uh, make such an inference? How do we compute such a conditional probability? Well, let's say that we have m observations for these random variables O, which are a subset of the, the big collection, the Vs. We want to know, we, we want to compute a query about some other bunch of random variables, so we'll call those uh, Q, and now we've divided up the world a little bit. The world started with just a bunch of random variables, and now it has a query that we're interested in. We want to know the probability distribution for those query variables conditional on the things we've observed. Okay, that's what we want to compute here. So we have this query. These are just random variables, unobserved ones. And we have a bunch of observed random variables that we know the actual values for. And the thing we're interested in is the thing at the bottom of the slide here. Okay, what is the probability distribution for the query variables given the ones that we've actually measured? Now, this is the point at which you look at the handout, some, some, some supplementary notes on probability. Okay, go away and read it now, and then come back. Okay, put me on pause. The rest of the world that we haven't filled in yet, all the original Vs that aren't queries and aren't observed are called latent variables. Okay, this, this term will come up a lot. Stuff you don't know about. Okay, this is latent variables. Now, computing the conditional distribution essentially comes down to summing over all possible combinations of values for those latent variables. That is because a conditional distribution, okay, is still a probability distribution. It's just that it might be different depending on the values you give to the conditioning random variables, okay? Or the observed random variables in this case. Okay, now the fundamental result from that handout is that if you have a distribution and you want to get rid of some of the random variables it talks about, then you sum over the ones you're not interested in. So to use the simplest possible uh, example of that, if I know the probability distribution for A and B, but I want to know the, what the probability distribution is just for A, I sum over the possible values for B. Simple, okay? And a conditional distribution is still just a distribution. So what you have at the bottom of this slide is just showing you that to get your query, what you need is to sum the latent variables out of this distribution here, okay? Which is the probability for the query and the latent variables given the observations, okay? And it still works because that's a conditional distribution, but it's still a distribution, okay? Now, 
Hopefully you've noticed also that this conditional distribution actually mentions all of the original random variables that we, that we called v to start with. Now what's going on with this, this last line here? Well, it's simply that when you write a conditional probability, you can, of course, go back to the original definition for conditional probability, which in its simplest form looks like this. Now, the point here is that the only reason that that denominator is there is to make sure that this, when you sum it over all values of A, results in a 1, okay? because probability distributions have to sum to 1. Okay, so whenever you see um, a conditional probability, you can actually think of it as being um, as here a joint probability that's been then been renormalized in a particular way so that it sums up to one again. Okay, you will often see one over z in the literature on Bayesian inference and machine learning. All that is saying is well, z is the number that you need in order to make things sum back up to 1 again. Okay, now the way I've just done this on the slide is cutting an awful lot of corners because I'm trying to give you the basic uh, roadmap. But once again, if you didn't uh, read the handout when I told you to, shame on you. Read it now, okay? Go back and read it. You need to read it. Um, it will make everything clear, I hope. Now what that tells you is that if you've got this joint probability distribution over all the random variables v, and you want to compute the distribution for some query variables given some observations, fundamentally the process is pretty simple. You just have to compute a sum, okay, and then normalize it so that uh, the distribution sums back up to one again, okay, and that's all well and good. What's a bit more interesting is um, what happens when we uh, think about Bayes' theorem in this context. Bayes' theorem is often introduces this very dry kind of uh, result. And the way it's generally introduced in probability courses, I think, doesn't really illustrate quite how brilliant and useful uh, it, it can be. Usually all you will see is the probability of A given B is the probability of B given A, probability of A over probability of B. Now, again, at this point, you need to have read the handout, okay? Because Bayes' theorem can be cast in a slightly more um, general form than that. Again, because uh, distributions uh, are distributions whether or not they're conditional. And this gets a little bit more interesting if you allow for some more conditioning events. In particular, you will get the following. Now I need to make some room for it. So let's get rid of that. You all know what that says. Now, the probability of A given B and C is the probability of B given A and C times the probability of A given C over the probability of B given C. Okay, that's a bit more interesting, but it's easy enough to prove, and you should go away and prove it. In fact, it might actually be in the handout, I can't remember. But what that's telling you is, if you know something about the probability of A given C, and then you measure something else, you could update it to get the probability of A given C and the new thing that you just measured. Okay, this is giving you a recipe for saying, here's your current state of knowledge, but now you measure something new. Now you learn a new piece of information. Bayes' theorem tells you how to update the knowledge as a result. Okay? And in this context, what it's saying is, this is an inference I've made before O' prime was observed. Bayes' theorem lets me update to get my knowledge after O' prime is observed. The update is this guy, okay, which actually corresponds to this chap here. 
And the Z once again just says, well, there's a denominator which is only there to make everything sum up to one again. That's this guy here. Okay, so Bayes' theorem does actually tell you something quite important when we start talking about this in terms of knowledge representation and reasoning. It tells you what to do to update your beliefs when a new piece of information comes along. So we've just solved uh, uncertainty and AI um, in its entirety, yeah? Um, it's just a simple calculation. Well, unfortunately, no. What are the problems here? Well, the first point, even if all of these random variables are just Boolean, if we've got n of them, okay, if, the, if, if it's v1, v2, all the way up to vn, then the joint probability uh, distribution needs a table of 2 to the power of n numbers. So your storage is order 2 to the n, unless you uh, do some clever stuff, which is exactly what Bayesian networks and Markov random fields are for. We'll come back to that later. Um, but certainly, if uh, you just do this naively, the storage is going to be a problem, because in practice, it's very, very easy to have n bigger than 1,000 uh, for, for real systems, um, and we don't want to have to store 2 to the power of 1,000 um, separate numbers. The second thing is, even if we could store them, we'd have to actually find them somewhere. Um, I have a thousand random variables, I need two to the power of a thousand combinations of numbers, where do I get those numbers from? Um, you can't just say you'll learn them from experience because there are too many. Um, and continuing with this theme, um, we've just uh, had an e equation that involves a summation, okay, over a subset of those random variables. If they're Boolean, that summation has 2 to the power of the size of big L terms. Okay? Um, so we're looking at exponential time to do the computation naively as well. This is what I mean when I say uh, that fundamentally it's all very simple, but in practice you quickly uh, find that it isn't. Now, this genuinely is uh, a hard problem computationally, because if you look at the uh, computational complexity. In a formal sense, it's number p complete. Now, number p completeness, I don't know if you guys get to see it in the computational complexity course, but what it means is, um, let's say you're not just interested in um, finding a yes-no answer, okay, which is the situation for algorithms when uh, you're talking about np completeness. Okay, if the SAT problem uh, give you a formula, I say is it satisfiable, you say yes or no, um, and that problem is NP complete. For number P complete problems we'd be saying well how many answers are there? Okay, I give you a SAT problem, I say how many ways can you assign variables to this thing to make it come out true, and you want to actually count them. Okay, and number P complete means it's the hardest in that class, in a, sen in a sense that's similar to talking about NP completeness. And it's even worse, because you can prove that even to get an approximate solution to this problem is intractable. Okay, so this is actually pretty tricky. You can, in practice, get around things, though. You can be clever about representing the distribution, as I've already mentioned. You can exploit the structure of that distribution, okay, as I've already mentioned. and that allows you in specific scenarios, okay, if you have enough structure in the joint probability distribution, um, that can actually get you as good as linear time. Okay, so the structure that you can find in the problem is important. And finally, you can do approximate inference. Okay, now there's a wider issue here. It turns out that essentially the universe gives with one hand and takes away with the other. And when we talk about machine learning and Bayesian inference, it gives you um, methods which, for which there are fairly simple expressions telling you how to calculate something, but actually doing the calculation ends up being hard. So there's an entire industry oh, in, in the research world um, devoted to solving Bayesian problems using approximate methods. Okay, um, And Sometimes, in fact quite often, that's the best you can hope for. Uh, there may be an expression involving an integral that tells you exactly how to compute a probability, but you can't evaluate that integral. You can then start by, for example, looking at methods for approximating that integral um, in an efficient way. Uh, and there are hordes of techniques within the wider field of Bayesian inference for AI 
uh, that look at doing this, uh, many of which I unfortunately won't have time to talk about. Now, I'm actually going to leave um, until the end of the course any further discussion of this real big picture kind of Bayesian um, inference. Um, I will come back to the idea of Bayesian networks and uh, Markov random fields and also talk about some of the ways in which you can actually make the inference process feasible, um, but I'm going to leave those till the end of the course. Um, partly because I just suspect that you guys are really wanting to know what I have to say about machine learning. So I'm going to do the, the specifically machine learning part of Bayesian inference first. Um, and to do that, I'm fundamentally uh, going, going to start with the simplest possible thing, which is linear regression. So we're going to start by putting that into a probabilistic f um, format and then start building on it. And uh, we're going to look at more and more uh, sophisticated ways of doing supervised learning within a Bayesian inference context. Now, I'm also going to take a, what might be regarded as a sidestep and talk about support vector machines, which aren't generally uh, considered to be a Bayesian method, but they are an extremely effective one uh, in practice. And I think all good machine learners should know about support vector machines. Um, I'm also going to talk about unsupervised learning, because that benefits a great deal as well from having a probabilistic context. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the fact that uh, once you get things within a probabilistic framework, one of the payoffs is that you can try and talk about what an optimal machine learner might look like. Um, that gives us the Bayes decision rule. So there's quite a lot of talk to talk about here. Um, I must apologise because uh, looking back at my slides, I see that I have to skip the next two in the, the handout. Um, they somehow escaped my yearly course update. They mentioned things like hidden Markov models uh, that I don't cover in this course anymore, but I sincerely do hope you cover elsewhere because they're uh, pretty important things to know about. The final thing I want to say just in this in introductory lecture is something about the books that you'll find useful. Um, if you have a copy of Artificial Intelligence of Modern Approach by Russell and Norvig, which you should have if you did the AI course last year, um, there's a lot of useful material in there. But the real core, particularly for the machine learning kind of stuff, I think is extremely well covered by Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning by Chris Bishop. If you want something that um, goes in, going into quite a bit more detail, then Machine Learning, a Probabilistic Perspective by Kevin Murphy is extremely good um, and covers a, an awful lot of ground. Um, and there are other books that I will mention, um, I think, as we go along, and I think that I've also put on the, uh, the course website um, that covers specific parts of this material in a great deal more detail. But that's the introduction, um, and I will leave it there for the first lecture. Um, in the next lecture, I'm going to go specifically into how we take the kind of supervised machine learning that you learned last year and place it in a probabilistic context so that we can start developing more uh, interesting and effective supervised learning algorithms.